Hey you and welcome. My name is Mike and in this old podcast we're venturing, well in the real world we're venturing into spring, but in these old stories we're venturing into revenge. Vengeance! These stories are revenge. If somebody cuts me off while I'm driving, yeah I'll be pissed. This fucking guy, am I right? Well these people, they took that to the extreme. Maybe uh, they have their reasons for it, but their reaction a little over the top. Uh, especially when kids are involved, so that's a that's a fair warning to you. In the first story, we got the Garman, and the second we got big, sweaty, both shitty. Before we get into it, if I could ask you please to to rate and review the podcast, my friends, it helps out so so much. It really really does. And if you do, next time you close your eyes, looking into a mirror, when you reopen them, I promise, I promise, I'll be standing right behind you with a big creepy grin. So look forward to that. <laughs> All right, but for now, let's give it a go. It's a house in the southwest of Calgary City, Alberta, in the Park Hill neighborhood where it all began. Well, I mean, to be to be fair, it was bubbling bubbling for a while, unbeknownst to most. But that's where we'll begin anyway, because that is where the horror did. Jennifer O'Brien, a busy mother with three young lads, was popping by that address on the Monday morning of June 30th, 2014. Her parents, Alvin and Kathy Lickness, lived there, and Jennifer's five-year-old son, Nathan, he'd spent the night with them in the house Jennifer and her four siblings grew up in. Alvin and Catherine, they doted on their young grandson, and they were only too happy to have him you know, spend the night with the grandparents some good ol' high quality time. So, Jennifer arrived, she parked, she opened her car door, she took a few steps to the front of the house, and she saw the door of the house was wide open. She walked in, carrying her baby son in her arms and she could instantly tell something was was very, very wrong. She was calling out to, to no response, to nothing. You know, the type of quiet when you can tell no one is here. Nothing living, anyway. And there was a certain, certain smell in the home. But the real giveaways were the pools of blood. Blood all over the house. But there was no bodies it was just an abattoir. What she did see were drag marks, as if people had been had been forcibly removed, dragged out of the home. And Alvin, Kathy, and young five-year-old Nathan were nowhere to be found. Now Jennifer immediately called her husband, telling him that our family had been had been murdered and that whoever did this had taken the bodies. She then called the police. And the police, the first thing they said to Jennifer was, get in your car and lock the door in case, well, you know. When the police arrived, they immediately began searching the house, you know, hoping that Nathan might still be alive. Maybe he could be hiding in the house or under a bed or something. No one was there. They found on the side door a lock that had been tampered with. Seems, you know, whoever did this, that's how they, how they popped in. Then there had been an attack, and the three people who had been in there, two elderly, one a young child, had been dragged out. If they were alive at the time or not, it was impossible to tell, but the amount of blood in the house, it didn't look good. Incredible story in Calgary, the one in the whole country is watching the disappearance of a five-year-old boy and his grandparents. No DNA or evidence relating to the perpetrator was found. In fact, they discovered diddly squat at the house relating to the killer, but a lot relating to the victims. The blood that was found kind of sort of everywhere matched that of the three people who were known to have been in the house. And they also found a tooth, which may have belonged to Alvin. So this had been pretty violent. A missing persons investigation began and an Amber Alert was issued for missing Nathan. This uh, was pretty quickly just about everywhere. An Amber Alert was issued Monday after Nathan's mother went to pick him up at his grandparents' Calgary home and found the trio was gone. There are signs they did not leave their home voluntarily. Tips came pouring in. Folk were pitching in for such a horrific crime. 
but nobody knew anything. There were a lot of people to speak to, though. See, the day before they went missing, the day before this kind of attack, it's believed that whatever happened, it happened on the Sunday night. And that weekend, the Saturday and the Sunday, the Licknesses, they held an estate sale. See, they were downsizing the house and they were moving. So, quite a lot of people would have been through the house that weekend before the attack on the Sunday night. The attack could have been something to do with that. Someone waltzed in, they had a goo, they liked what they saw, and then they came back. There was a lot of footprints. Dozens, possibly even more than that people who would have gone through there. But, it did not seem like this was any kind of robbery, that things were stolen. The only things missing was the grandparents and their young grandson. And Jennifer, she'd actually been there with her baby the night before. She was planning on staying in her parents' house, but at around a quarter to 11 p.m., Jennifer, she decided to just go home. The baby just wouldn't settle. So sometime between 11 p.m. on the Sunday night and early on the Monday morning, someone came in with murder on the mind. It was four days later that the police released their first lead to the public. It was a green truck a late 80s, early 90s Ford F-150. It had been on the street, outside the house, the night, whatever happened, happened. Police releasing photos of this truck that they're looking for. They're looking to identify the truck and the driver of the vehicle, who they say may have information about the three missing. Releasing this information turned out to be a very, very smart move, because not long after, the police got a call from a woman saying, Yep! I sure know who owns that F-150, because I'm pretty much sure I'm looking at the bloody, maybe literally bloody, thing. She said that truck belonged to her very own brother. The woman who called to report this, her name was Patty Garland. And the brother of Patty Garland was Douglas Garland. She was looking at that Ford F-150 because she was staying at her parents' house. Her brother lived with her parents. See, she had come from her home about three hours away with her partner, Alan Lickness. Alan Lickness, the son of the victims, who was now trying to find his parents and his nephew. So Douglas Scarland, a man in his early 50s, he was taken in for questioning by the police. And a search was quickly undertaken on the 40-acre property where the Garlands lived. Now, it was out in the middle of nowhere, Alberta, surrounded by acres and acres of fields, There was a couple of sheds, there was a couple of barns. And the police were hoping, you know, someone might still be alive. But searching this almost endless ranch, they did find some things. A duffel bag, inside handcuffs, a knife, a club. Role playing? I don't think so. And so, they kept the search on. One thing they did find was a burning barrel far removed from the property. But inside was nothing but ash. Over 300 officers would get involved in the search, combing through the nearby fields and wetlands. In the meantime, though, Douglas, he was arrested. But he wasn't arrested on murder or anything like that. No, he was actually arrested on identity theft charges. See, get this. Douglas Garland had assumed the identity of a fella named Matthew Hartley, who died like 30 years prior. Douglas was living under an assumed identity because, about 25 years before, he had been charged with running a meth lab on his farm and he had fled while on bail. The police, they had him for that and so they could keep him and try and, you know, turn the burners on him. Douglas, he actually has a, he has quite the backstory, but, but we'll, we'll get to that in a bit. Point is, on the 7th of July, one week after the, yeah, well, we can assume murders with that amount of blood, he was arrested. On the 11th of July, however, he was released on $750 bail. He wasn't giving the police anything in relation to the kidnappings. I don't know much about bail in Alberta, but $750 bucks for bail seems a little bit low for me, especially I mean when he's your number one bozo. So I think, and I could be completely wrong in this, they set the bail so low so they could let him go and watch him, see what he would do. After all, I mean, the chances weren't great that the three victims were still alive, but they might be. They wanted to see where he went. Hopefully, he would return to the scene of the crime. Now, when they released him, they were like, All right, listen up, Doug. You're not allowed to return to the family farm. You know, we're letting you go on $750, but you're not allowed to go home. 
That's off limits, all right, Bookaroo? He said, sure. Douglas said, of course. We're going to go back there. Come on now. It's a possible crime scene. He'll stay at a motel. Did he fuck? No, of course he didn't. He tried to crawl through the bushes and shit back to the farm because he's a dumbass. The day he was released, at about half one in the AM, a helicopter with infrared vision watched him as he crawled like a ninja, like a solid snake over here, through the fields towards his house. As usual, this is a one-man infiltration mission. I can't just knock on the door and ask them to let me in. I mean, in the infrared, he was, he was as clear as day. Army-style crawling, while well, the police were basically staring at him in the darkness, slowly marching up to arrest him. So there was definitely, though, you know, I mean, this told the police there was definitely something on that farm he wanted to go back for. It was later that day that Douglas was charged with two counts of first-degree murder and one count of second-degree murder. Two weeks after a five-year-old boy and his grandparents disappeared, Calgary police announced today what no one wanted to hear, that they will be laying murder charges, turning a missing persons investigation into a homicide investigation. See, they found a lot more during their search of the Garland property. Ponderance of evidence is such that has led our investigators to believe that they are dead. Inside that burn barrel, under the ash, they found bits of bone, teeth, and a pair of glasses. They were unable to determine who owned the glasses, but one of the elderly Licknesses. As the days went by, there's always a hope. There's always a glimmer of hope. And unfortunately, with the laying of the charges, we've taken that hope away from the family. A computer hard drive was found, and it was it was filled with, um, hmm... Murdery shit is the best way of putting it. A book titled How to Kill Without Joy, the complete how to kill book. The Death Dealer's Manual, an autopsy book. Photos of people in adult diapers. He was obsessed with, with adult diapers. Not too sure about that now, but um, okay. Lots of pictures of dead and dismembered and some pretty dark and disturbing porn. On his Google history, things like most painful torture, human dissection, bone grinder, blood removal solution, information on how to crack the lock that was found cracked at the home of Alvin and Catherine. In the house, 89 pairs of men and women's shoes, wigs, more adult diapers, teeth fragments, bits of bone, a straight jacket, knives, gun parts, shackles, Bloodstained footprints that matched those found at the crime scene, and meat hooks hanging from the ceiling, on which the DNA of all three victims were found. And all of this gruesome, hideous, disturbing shite, they didn't find any of the bodies. They didn't find Nathan, Alvin, or Catherine. The crowning piece of evidence, though, when this would go to trial, would be something that came from the heavens. See, at half 9 a.m. on the 1st of July, the day after the scene at the house was discovered, a surveyor's plane was flying over Airdrie, where the Garland farm was, and it was snapping away pictures of the town and, and the surrounding countryside. It would take a picture every three seconds, one of these photos being directly over the Garland farm. That photo, it showed three bodies lying face down on the ground, near some sheds away from the main family house. Two of those bodies were big enough to be adults, naked with a cloth over the waist. And those two bodies, they appeared to have been decapitated. Beside, there was a turd body, a smaller child size. When he flew the plane, you know, once again over Airdrie, though later that same day, the bodies were gone. An aerial photo captured by chance over Garland's farm shows two bodies and a third small figure lying in the grass. Surveillance video showed his truck around the Lickness home the same day they were reported missing. At one point, a white tarp was seen in the box. Two hours later, it was empty. I mean, obviously, Douglas Garland is one sick bitch, but why did he do this? There's no good reason. No reason is ever good enough to do what he did, but... I'll give you Doug's reason. 
See, Alvin Lickness, he was a businessman, and he was at one point doing business with Douglas. He was in oil and gas exploration in, in Alberta. And he hired Douglas Garland at one point to like invent this pump that would separate oil and water. This was all the way back in 2006. This relationship, however, it came to an end in early 2007. Douglas was let go from the business because he just stopped talking to Alvin. He stopped answering his phone calls. He just ghosted him, essentially. So Alvin was like, uh, okay, are you quitting? Are you quite quitting or do I just fire you? But by this stage, Douglas had already, you know, done up the designs for the pump, which Alvin patented. That rubbed him the wrong way. Douglas thought he should get some credit on the invention. Now, this type of pump, it never really made any money. Like, it's not like Douglas Garland was cheated out of millions of dollars or anything like that. No, it was just credits. That's all he was really upset about. And this would gnaw away at Douglas for years and years until, well... Now, Douglas, he had previously been kicked out of college, actually medical school, <laughs> for cheating. And this was after he had a mental breakdown. He had been arrested numerous times on weapons violations and assault. Nothing really ever came of it. When he was 33 years old, he was arrested for running a meth lab on the Garland Farm in Airdrie. But while out on bail, he fled to British Columbia. And that's where he stole the identity of Matthew Hartley a 14-year-old boy that had been killed in a car crash about a decade before. So he lived in Vancouver under the name of Matthew Hartley for about seven years, and he worked at a lab there, but he was fired. He was collecting unemployment under the dead boy's name. He ended up doing some time for that. He would spend six months in jail, and there he'd be diagnosed as being mentally ill. And so in the early morning of June 30th, he broke the lock of the Lickness's home. He attacked Alvin, Kathy, and Nathan and dragged them to his truck, which was just outside. What he did after that is um, probably gruesome, but no one, no one knows. The bodies, they've never been found. They were likely burnt and Douglas never said. The trial, it began in January 2017. Douglas Garland pled not guilty and showed just no emotion at all throughout the entire thing. On February 16th, 2017, Douglas was found guilty on three counts of first degree murder. He was sentenced to life without parole for the maximum of 75 years. At his age, in his mid to late 50s, a life sentence. Garland himself looked much the same in court, but hunched over and having trouble to walk. As it has also been reported, he's been assaulted in prison multiple times since his 2017 conviction. Now for another tale of vengeance with disturbing, disturbing ass consequences. The thread between these two stories is that uh, A, the motive is stupid, B, the victims were completely innocent. For these kind of stories, the victims are always pretty much innocent of what they're being killed for. But there's also people who literally had nothing to do with the original motive. They got got to. So now we go to Wiwilika. Wiwilika is, is located like almost in the geographic center of the mainland USA. <laughs> it's the definition of flyover. About a, a thousand people live there with a hefty amount below the poverty line. It's one of these things back in the day, the railroad come troop down. Not so much around a mall. Like one review of the town on niche.com says, it's a small town where everyone knows each other. You know, it has, it has a family dollar. It has a nursing home. You know, things they should put into tourism ads. They have a place called Indian Center where kids can hang out and play basketball. Okay, that's, that's great stuff right there. Willick is a place where there's more churches than really anything else. You know what? I'm sure it's just great. It's a lovely place. It's my new favorite place. But what our story is about ain't so lovely. And it begins in June 2008. That summer was hot. Real hot. Hot, hot. The days, they were long and two girls were walking on a lonely, rural road just outside of Willica. Skyla Whitaker, 11 years old, and Taylor Pascal Placker, 13 years old, both attended Graham Dustin School just outside of town, and on the 8th of June, which was a Sunday, they were out walking together not far from Taylor's home. Now Skyla, she wanted to be a vet when she grew up. She'd walk everywhere barefoot, 
followed by her many cats. Taylor, she wanted to be a forensic scientist, and she was someone with a big heart. So that day, it was very, very warm. They wanted to be out and about. It's not like there's a whole lot to do other than stroll the dirt roads and fields of this middle America. As dinner time approached, they weren't answering the phone calls to come to their Oklahoman home. Taylor's grandfather, he went out to see if he, he could find them and wrestle them back in. He kind of just started walking along the road to see if he could spy them. And he did. He did find both Skyla and Taylor, his granddaughter. They were face down in a ditch a quarter mile from the house. Taylor's granddad thought first that they had been knocked down. It was a hit and run, but that wasn't it. This was at about 5.30 p.m. Both Skyla and Taylor had been shot dead and just left there. Shocking would be an understatement, I believe. Unbelievable would be more fitting. Unfortunately, though, it had to be believed. Like, how could this happen to, to two children just walking the road in the middle of nowhere? Both girls had been shot multiple times. Skyla eight times, Taylor five times. They were both clothed, so there was no sign of, of sexual trauma or anything like that. The fact that they were both shot so many times and ditched in a ditch, it was very methodical. As if, like, somebody would have a grudge against a child. The Oklahoma State Bureau of Investigation took on the case. The hunt for the suspects, who could be anyone and anywhere, but more likely among the 1,000 people who resided in Willica. What was more likely? What the police, you know, their initial theory going on and whatever sick bitch murdered these two young girls was that maybe they were walking, they saw something they weren't supposed to see. Maybe they ran into people they weren't supposed to. Drunks or, or drug addicts. Crime in this region, it was on the up. Uh, drugs was playing a major part in that. Like uh, meth heads out in the woods, that sort of thing. The other option is just a random shooting for the heck of it, which makes this very hard, well, immensely more harder, you know, to solve. Or maybe someone had tried to had tried to abduct the two girls, but it went wrong, and so they didn't want them to be able to identify them. It was quickly learned that two different guns were used, and so the investigators, they began to think that perhaps it was two people they ran into. We know that there's two different calibers involved, and they were suspecting at least two different shooters. Gel casings. They were found, and the OSBI, the Oklahoma State Bureau of Investigations, sent over 60 letters to registered owners of 40 caliber handguns in the area. 40 people responded out of those 60. None of those 40 matched the five shell casings found. Agents told us that they are looking for a 40 caliber Glock 22 handgun. They didn't ask for the 22, which was the other gun used in the shooting, um, but I guess it seemed unlikely that unless the, the killer stole and returned the weapon, it's unlikely that the killer would rock up with, you know, have a goo, my murder weapon. A reward of $25,000 was offered for any information leading to an arrest. Whatever the case, though, the reward, which was later substantially increased, that would remain unclaimed. And so a year passed. The entire region was in mourning for these two children. Police went out, asking for anyone, someone, to come forward to, to help solve this, this horrendous crime. We do believe there are other people who have information as to who this person or these people are. I don't know why they have not come forward, but they need to. We are one piece of information away from making an arrest. The police went unanswered. Now, about 35 minutes drive north of Willica lies another town, the town of Okmulgee. It's a town of approximately 10,000 people, so it has a, a little bit more going for it than we Willica. And it was in Okmulgee that 23-year-old Ashley Taylor disappeared. 
Ashley Celeste Taylor was last seen by a relative on the 15th of July 2011. Ashley, she was a churchgoer, an animal lover, and a passionate family woman. She had a brother, a sister, a full life ahead until July 2011. She was last seen in Oak Molji. Well, that's the last time she was properly seen, that is, because two days later, somebody else reported she was seen just off a highway near Shilter, south of Oak Molji, which is the route you'd probably take if you're going to Wilika. Ashley was reported missing on the 29th of July, 2011. The next day, as the investigation began to, to try and find her, the police interviewed her fiance, Kevin Sweat. Big Sweaty. Uh, it's kind of a misleading name. His body is small, his brain is small, his dick are small. Though I'm sure all are sweaty. He was questioned about the last time he saw his girl. See, when Ashley's mother told the police about the last time she had spoken with her, which was on the 15th of July, Ashley said her and Kevin, they were going to Louisiana to get married. Holy monkey! They were supposed to have returned, you know, by the, by the 29th of July. And when Ashley didn't, that's when, you know, the Popo police got a ring ring. I mean, see, her mother thought, you know, if Ashley got married, she would have called. And her brother's birthday came and went with no sign of her, and she would have called to wish her brother a happy birthday, right? And obviously, during all this time, no one could contact her. And so, the police contacted the next best, worst, thing. Kevin. He never missed a day's work. Lead you to believe he never went down to Louisiana or left the state. And so, it was Kevin. He was the one who said he had last seen her on the 17th of July, two days after she was last seen by anybody else on the side of the road. Or, at least, that's that's what he said. His story was this. His spiel was this. He said that as they were driving southbound, you know, towards their wedding date, they got into an argument. Womp womp. And so, he said, you're out of here. He, he basically kicked her out of the car on the side of the highway, if you can believe that. And he drove off then, abandoning her never to be seen again. Then he said he drove around, he went to his dad's home in Willika. He burned tapes and notebooks, presumably related to his one-time future missus. And then he went back to their home, which is now his home, in Oak Mulji. A few days later, though, his story, it changed. This time, he said they had fought, physically. And well, he ended up slitting her throat beside a lake on the way to Louisiana. As you uh, as you do. He admitted he killed her, but it was a crime of passion, he said. But when the lake was searched, there was no sign of Ashley in that lake, which is where he said he dumped her body. What the police did do was go to Kevin's father's home in Willika, and it was there, at a fire pit, they found bones believed to be Ashley's. Her DNA was also found on an axe. So this didn't seem like a crime of passion anymore at all. And Kevin, he was arrested. Now, Kevin was born in 1986, a native of Oak Mulji, okay with me, pal. He had two siblings, two older brothers, and he attended Wilson High School in Oak Mulji, where Kevin, he was bullied. And it was there he became friends with Ashley. Now, Kevin, he worked in a few fast food restaurants, but he had high hopes of becoming a cop. Which is kind of something we see again and again with killers. That was, however, of course, till he was arrested for Ashley's murder. But until that point, he hadn't been in trouble with the law at all. He had some you now minor incidents related to drugs, paraphernalia, that sort of thing, but certainly nothing violent whatsoever. Minor shit. And as I said, Kevin and Ashley, they became friends in high school. Two loners who found each other, and then soon they became more than friends. While Kevin worked, Ashley cared for her mother and siblings who had special needs. However, tragedy struck young Kevin in 2007, when one of his brothers died of a drugs overdose. After that, Kevin, well gosh darn it, he just lost that twinkle in his eye. It drove him to be, to be closer to Ashley though, they moved in together, and eventually he popped the question. Now, their relationship though wasn't perfect. Kevin... After, as I said, after his brother's death, he became almost a different person. He became angry. They would fight a lot. And it seems, Kevin, he had some issues. Regrets about popping the question. That maybe he shouldn't have asked Ashley to marry him after all. See, he kept up a blog, uh, this time on the website DeviantArt, under the name Joseph I. Morgan. 
which is his middle name and his mother's maiden name. Now, you can you can check out this blog if you want to. It's still up there. It's full of uh, very cringy emo style images staring off into space. Lots of pictures in black and white that you probably would have thought were artistic, but were really just shit. Yeah, the kind of stuff you might have posted on MySpace back in the day when you were 14 years old and were just so deep, man, whoa. He also had a lot of pictures of himself posing with guns. In May 2010, he wrote on his blog, I'm living on my own or somewhere. I got engaged not too long ago. Biggest mistake of my life. Wish I knew she was a complete basket case, medicated and suicidal before I got with her. Now, I'm kind of stuck, but no worries yet. I'm saving up money so I can finally leave Oklahoma once and for all. It's not like I'm keeping all this a secret. Hell, my family knows I'm planning on leaving. Just didn't tell them it was permanent. When the police searched Kevin's home after he was arrested for Ashley Taylor's murder, they found some shells. Shells which matched the casings from a double murder three years prior. See, the OSBI had discovered back in 2010 that a man named Kevin Sweat had purchased a Glock handgun about six months before the double homicide of Skyla and Taylor. He was also living in Henrietta, which is uh, the next town over from Willica. He was questioned at the time, but he said he sold it. You know, this was when they were trying to track down everybody who lived in the area who had the, the type of guns used. But as I said, when they questioned him, he said he didn't have it anymore. All right. Left it at that. So after he was arrested for Ashley's murder, he was questioned about the Willika murders. In August, Sweat was charged with Ashley's murder. He remains in jail. Her family says when Ashley disappeared, they cornered Kevin Sweat at the couple's apartment and demanded answers. I know you didn't let her out of the car. I said you probably did something with my cousin, just like you probably did something with those Willika girls. I definitely believe that he had something to do with the other two girls. And get a load of this, right? He said he had been driving along the road they were on that day. North 3890 Road. He had stopped off at one point and he saw two monsters coming at him. Two demons, he said. He had some kind of vision, hallucination of these two children being um, kind of like um, uh, goblins from like the Lord of the Rings or something. He was being attacked by these creatures. And so he had to defend himself. And so he shot them both. First with one gun, then he whipped out the other gun. What? I came here to, to hear the truth. And we know that you were there. We know that you were responsible. I'm guessing I was mental issues. I was seeing shit. Okay. Seeing what? I don't know, things, monsters. Okay. And what'd you do? Panicked. Okay. And shot. He was charged with the murder of Skyla Whitaker and Taylor Pascal Plank. And his attorneys argued that he should be tried for the three murders at once. One trial for all. He had psychological tests done and he was found to be fit to stand trial. The death penalty was on the cards for all the killings. Kevin Sweat would waive his right to a jury trial, and just a few days before the trial was due to start, he pleaded guilty to all murders. He wanted to avoid the death penalty because he knew he would get it if he pleaded not guilty. The reason he pleaded guilty to it all was the result of some new evidence which came to light. New evidence which would finally show a motive as to why he killed the two young girls. The reason he killed Ashley, he was just a psycho who, I, I don't know, I don't know why he killed Ashley, he was just a psychopath who I guess didn't see leaving her as an option. The reason he killed the two young girls though was very, very different. His whole monster story was just dipping toes in the old insanity defense. Good one! He knew what he was doing that day. No demons, no goblins. Only, to his mind, revenge. See, he was not happy with the Placker family to which Taylor belonged. See, Kevin had come to believe that the Placker family had been the one to sell his brother the drugs which were tainted, causing the overdose. And so, Kevin Sweat thought, well, 
an eye for an eye. Christopher Placker, who was Taylor's brother, he would testify that he did sell Kevin's brother some drugs. Kevin, he was found guilty. And he was due to be sentenced on the 24th of October 2014. But during that time, uh, hmm, things got just a tad dramatic. In the courtroom, right before the sentencing, Kevin, he was in the back room with his court-appointed attorney. When all of a sudden, the guards were locking down the courtroom and telling everybody to get down. This is the secretary's office where Kevin Sweat took out a razor blade and cut his attorney's neck. They were all just standing right here having a meeting. Kevin had somehow managed to smuggle in a razor blade and attacked his own attorney, trying to slice his throat open. Now, he did get a cut in, but it was minor. I'm not sure what he was thinking trying to murder his own attorney, but there you go. Maybe he too was a demon. Well, I mean, he was a lawyer, so... Eh. Kevin Sweat was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Three times, in fact. Later, he tried to withdraw his pleas. He wanted a jury trial. That went over like a lead balloon. When the two girls were found on that lonely road in Oklahoma... They were fully clothed, right? No signs of sexual assault. But semen was found on them. You know, when Kevin was arrested, he admitted to it all. It was, it was case closed, right? But the DNA that was found on the two girls, it eliminated Kevin's sweat. Allegedly. Now, the police haven't released anything about this, so I don't have a lot to go on. But that's something, I guess. I mean, it's hard to say when the police haven't confirmed or denied it. It was a little nug, but the police, they believe they got their eye. Kevin admitted doing it. But maybe he was not alone. You know, something messed up also later on was that an alert went out to the families of his victims, saying that he had escaped prison. And it fully freaked everybody out, all the family members and, and well, everyone. Now, he hadn't escaped prison. It was, it was due to a clerical error, though. But it still managed to scare the shit out of everybody that this tree-time killer could be out. But still... Kevin Sweaty wants out. New trial. Godspeed and good luck to any attorney taking on him as a client. And that ends the story. These stories of vengeance for not, not great motives and really tragic victims. Shanae, thank you so much for listening. I really appreciate you taking the time to, to listen to this whole podcast. Uh, it, means, it means a lot to me. So until I see you... Until you hear from me, as always, please take care of each other and yourselves because I love you. Mike out.